Hello, this is an oral history interview with Roberta Banizek. Is that the correct pronunciation? That is correct. Banizek Glider, interviewed today by Sammy Morris in the Purdue Oral History Program Project. Um, we are inside the Archives and Special Collections, and the date is October 5th, 2017. Roberta, thank you for joining us for the Oral History Program. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we're excited to talk with you. I know that you have been honored for many awards throughout the years, and you have given your collection to us, and I think that this is going to be a really nice addition to some of the areas we're really trying to focus on growing, like women in the STEM disciplines and women who have graduated from Purdue and made important contributions to their field. So your, your interview covers several areas of interest for us, from alumni to women in STEM to just being a very accomplished alum. So thank, thank you, you for doing this. Um, what I'm going to do is ask you a little bit about your early background, and then we'll start talking some about Purdue and beyond Purdue. So if you could please tell us when and where you were born. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, um, August 20th, 1938. Great. And did you have any siblings growing up? I have an older brother. He's uh, just a little shy of four years older than me. Okay. He is deceased now. So you are the second child then. Then I am the second child. Okay, yes. so the baby. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you first decide to attend Purdue? Well, it's an interesting situation that happened. My parents uh, are didn't have the, the uh, resources to be educated. My um, mother's case, there were nine children, and uh, the older son was going to go to medical school, so everyone got up to fourth or fifth grade, and they all had to go to work mm. to raise money so that he could go to medical school, the one out of the nine. Wow. So, and my mother, I mean, she's extremely bright. She has a high IQ. She works the New York uh, Times puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> she's terrific. Uh, but just doesn't have formal education. Mm -hmm. And my father uh, is the same, only thing he had a little bit more schooling, but um, uh, just, uh, well, he worked the puzzles too. <laughs> well, that's good. So they probably were big readers, even if they didn't have that chance at formal education, I'm guessing. Yes, okay. yes, that's true. And so when it got time to, I they got the money together and saved so that I could go to a girl's school mm -hmm. and it was Mercy High School <clears throat> and it uh, was in Chicago and there were about 2,000 young women uh, mm -hmm. in the school mm -hmm. and it was I was math science all the way I took always the hardest courses because I enjoyed them they were uh -huh. challenging and so when it got to the end where we're into the high school what what I do and so they're talking about it in school where are you going to go to college and I thought I don't know <laughs> what are you going to say I don't know <laughs> and it ended up that my mother when I asked her and my father and they said well the most educated person really is Dr. Kachala our dentist and he's the most friendly um, and you go ahead and ask him because I went there regularly because I didn't develop enamel on my teeth because I had uh, scarlet fever oh, as, a, as a child oh no. during that development phase. So there was, there was a lot of visits to the dentist. Yes. So our friendly dentist was kind enough, and he, I said, uh, my mother said to ask you, um, you know, what uh, w w w what should I study? You know, mm -hmm. what should I study? And I uh, said, what do you like best? And I said, everything. <laughs> uh, what courses did you do the best in? And I said, well, I got straight A's. And he yeah. said, "Well, what do you really want to do?" And I said, "I don't, I don't know. I uh -huh. don't have enough knowledge." And he said, "Well, well, tell me something." And I said, "Well, I want to study the hardest thing that I can study at the university and at university." And I and he said, "Well, I can't tell you right now, but I'll get together with my fellow doctors and then we'll find out what is the hardest subject you can study <laughs> at a university." I said, okay, great. So a couple of weeks later, I met the dentist, and he kindly uh, uh, said, I talked with them, and the most difficult course that you could take in college is chemical engineering. Okay. I said, okay, that sounds fine. Yeah. 
didn't know anything about engineering, but that was fine. Yeah. It was fine with me. Uh, and then I said, oh, where do I study this? And he said, well, I'll find out, and I'll tell you in your next visit. Mm -hmm. So he found out, and he said, well, chemical engineering, the top school in the United States is Purdue University, uh, University of Illinois. Uh, there are a couple other schools, Michigan, that are not as good as Purdue, but uh, they're good schools. Um, of course, he didn't know that women get rejected from things like mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that they don't accept, whereas Purdue does mm -hmm. accept women. So I was very fortunate, applied to Purdue University, uh, was accepted, and it was a, a wonderful thing because then I did not, then I found out later that the other schools did not accept women in their engineering programs in, wow. in, uh, in, in 1956. Yeah. Were you surprised when he told you that the best place wasn't all that far from where you were? I came home elated, I bet. absolutely elated <laughs> that it was within driving distance of Chicago. Yes. Oh, my. It was just a, a real treat that this was going to happen for me. And I had a wonderful uh, opportunity. Uh, Purdue University did offer me a scholarship, a full scholarship, which was tremendously important for my parents because they did not have the resources to support. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had to get the uh, principal at the school of Mercy High School to sign the papers. They already had signed the papers for me to come, so uh -huh. it was not a difficult thing. But they, uh, what happened was I went with my piece of paper to the principal's office and said, I, I need your signature on this for a scholarship. And she said, I see it's Purdue University. I said, yes, just like you, you all signed the other papers that I could apply. Uh, come back another time. How about next week come back? Bring the paper with you. And I said, oh. So, okay. Hmm. Next week I go in, and now there are a couple sisters, the nuns uh, of the Sisters of the Mercy, sitting there. And uh, I thought, this is strange. And so they sat me down in a chair and there was just a couple of them walking around, and they said, you can't go there. You can't go to Purdue. I said, I beg your pardon? You know, we'll, we'll, uh, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. You'll be a pagan. <laughs> you're going to lose your religion. <laughs> Another one says you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> now, what, was it because <laughs> Purdue allowed men students, or was it because Purdue wasn't a religious student? School or? No. Well, the next statement that they came out with was, women do not study engineering. Uh-huh. Uh you do not, you do not do that. You will become a pagan. You women do not do things like that. You can go to Loyola Marymount or somewhere, uh -huh. and you can study to, to be a teacher. And I said, no, I, I'm studying to be an engineer. They said, come back next week. Bring your paper. So I go back next week, and now there are about four or five nuns. And they went in a circle like they were hovering over me, and they said the same statements that didn't make any sense to me at all. And they actually, it went on and on and on. And I came out of there, and I was crying each time. Mm -hmm. I felt so bad. My parents couldn't afford to send me to Purdue, and that was now what I wanted to do more than anything else in the world. Mm -hmm. And I was being denied that. Mm -hmm. And I'd be crying, and my friends would cover around me and try and make me feel better. They never did sign the papers. What happened was the scholarship went unawarded. Um, my father took out his retirement from the steel mills where he worked, mm -hmm. and he they paid for my education at Purdue with the funds that my father took all his retirement money out. So when he wow. retired, he had nothing. That's incredible. So it was a very sad situation, but I was thrilled to come to Purdue because that was what was in my heart. I'm, I'm thrilled that you and your parents didn't let that stop you from coming to where you wanted to go. Um, that's that's an incredible story. It just makes you wonder about how many people weren't even able to go where they wanted to, you know? Very truly. You wonder who else has was had the nuns going in circles around time. They're going to burn in hell. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Women don't do things <laughs> like that. <laughs> they get you excited about math and science teaching it to you, and then they tell you to go into to teaching and you know. Well, math was not something that everyone wanted to take, oh, uh, I and see. and I of course 
I, you know, I enjoyed math uh-huh. uh, as well as all the other subjects, but um, I, the newfangled thing to me was the slide rule, uh-huh. which Purdue has now. Both my my husband's in my slide rules That's in the archives, yes. and uh, that was not the slide rule that I taught myself how to use the slide rule, but the, one mm-hmm. of the nuns, uh, uh, Sister Kenneth, I remember her so clearly saying, I want you to teach the rest of the students how to use the slide rule. And so my meager information, and it was it was good fun, and it was good practice before coming into Purdue. That's great. That's great. And it, and it does really show the importance of slide rules to the kind of discipline that you are going into, that Purdue, almost everyone who graduated from Purdue during those decades has a slide rule that they have held on to because, you know, before calculators, that was critical, so. It's very um, true, and to get it away from my husband and I into the yeah, archives was, was uh, it would took us, uh, we did some real soul searching. I said, well, we can wait till after we, after we pass away. Yes. And then I said, but how do we know that they'll, the the children will even find the slide rules, so that's yes. when we said we will. Well, we're we'll very put them grateful in the <laughs> to you because we know that the importance that kind of object has to your memories of your time at Purdue. So that's wonderful. Um, so thinking back, okay, so you finally were able to attend Purdue because of the sacrifices that your family made. Uh, do you remember what your first impressions were when you came to campus? I went to Doomy Hall. Went to Doomy Hall first, okay. <laughs> and uh, I was amazed at the campus right now in the year 2017 is, is uh, humongous, uh, whereas then it was small, but to me it was huge. Yes. To me it was a huge universe that it was a new place that I was going to stay. Never lived away from home, so mm-hmm. it was a new... That was also from that era. But what... Uh, impressed me when I walked into Dumi Hall was they had a, a big photo, bigger than life size, uh, of Amelia Earhart. Oh, yes. yes. And uh, I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's something I'll never, you know, be able to achieve. But isn't that wonderful? There's an, a woman. Yeah. Not like the nuns said. <laughs> it's, right. It's it's kind of letting you know you're you're here. You're in the right place. I'm in the it? right place. Yeah. Uh-huh. It was uh, it was a it was very warm to have that feeling. That's wonderful. You know, I think that's probably why um, she was invited to the staff for that reason because. In the, in the 30s, the growth of the women students was really exponentially higher than previous decades. And so it could be that, you know, President Elliott wanted someone to be a good role model for the women students. He also brought in Lillian Gilbreth at the that same time. Be, yes, so. very impressive, both of them. <laughs> Did you, was Lillian Gilbreth around when you were in school at Purdue? Uh, not to my knowledge, okay. but then she may have been, but I was so absorbed with my classes. Sure. And then uh, there was a newfangled thing to me of going through sorority rush. Oh, yes. Which was a, a, a very good thing, uh, the diversity and uh the different kinds of accommodations and you got to meet more people and it was a it was a very positive part of the Purdue experience. So how did that start? So I know you said you initially lived in Doomy Hall, right? Yes. When did you first hear about the, is, was this Chi Omega? Yes. Uh-huh. When when did you become on their radar, I guess, or are they on yours? Well, they started, they had Rush, uh, I forgot which part of the year, it's so many years mm-hmm. ago, uh, but it was, everybody was doing it, you know, uh-huh. and, and I thought, oh, you know, I'll put my name in the hat too. As is, I'm game for learning everything, meeting more people, and uh, so I went through Rush. I, I went through all the processes, came to the final two things, and it was Chi Omega and Pi Phi. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Chi Omegas were uh, very uh, outgoing and friendly and bouncy, and I have a lot of energy, so there was a lot of good sense there. And then the Pi Phi's were a little bit more. Uh, a little bit less of, mm-hmm. of those attributes, uh, but I call, I called my uh, oh I called my mother to say uh, this was what happened, and she said I hope I didn't ruin things for you, but I got a phone call from a lady from uh, the, from the Pi Fi's 
from and she said she was an alumna and my mother was not familiar with any of this this was all greek to her uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> she had never heard of this she said i hope i didn't ruin it for you because she asked if uh what what uh uh, what uh, country club we belong to. <laughs> and that's hardly what my parents and my father is a steel worker and my mother is a homemaker and barely making my, my tuition for school and the books and everything. And she said, I told them the truth that we don't belong to a country club. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the end of the conversation. I said, really? Well, I have a choice that I have to make. And I think you've just helped me, Mother. Yes. There's no question about where the priorities are, and it sealed it off and made a very easy decision for me. That really worked out well. I it? felt very lucky. <laughs> That's wonderful. Were there any um, rituals that you were part of? Not that you would, of course, speak to those on the record, but I'm just curious, like, um, did you go through a process as an initiate, I guess, Oh yes, uh -huh. oh yes. It was it was very interesting because it was all dignified and mm -hmm. uh, uh, actually the one thing that we did do. Uh, I guess they'd uh, say that it was some kind of uh, a penalty, but I didn't consider it a penalty. Uh, polishing silver. So when all the pledges, we got together in the dining room and polished some silver. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that does I, seem very dignified. <laughs> <laughs> And it was fun. We all got to chat and mm -hmm. sing a few songs, and uh, it was a, a very positive experience uh, as a pledge. Mm -hmm. um, I guess others were not so lucky, but uh, the the Kayamegas were true to uh, what, and I followed through with the philosophy then as after I graduated and, and uh, became part of alumni organizations and contributed back to the students to, uh, um, in fact, I... I endowed a scholarship at the Chi Omega mm. for women engineering students. That's wonderful. To encourage them to study engineering. That is fantastic. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful way to give back. Um, I'm curious, okay, so when you came to Purdue, would that have been around 1957 or so? 1956 is when 56. I graduated, so therefore it was the fall of 1956, and then I graduated I in 1960. And then I know that um, you've talked in previous interviews a little bit about, um, you know, how few women students there were at Purdue, especially in engineering. But I'm just curious, do you remember what it was like whenever you realized you were the only woman in the classroom and how, did, how that felt? Well, it, 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 it didn't feel bad except for two occasions. Um, it, I, the the male students we had some a lot of veterans in our classes that had just come back from from the wars and so they didn't have to pay for tuition and it was great they did not like having a little well it wasn't that little but a, a young woman uh, as a as a, at the same level with them mm -hmm. that actually I hate to say it was smarter than they were mm -hmm. and they did resent my presence. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but one of the uh, occasions was uh, when uh, I was in a freshman, and I had promised my parents that I would graduate because Daddy took his the, all the pension out. So I was going to graduate. Yes, I, no matter what, I was going to graduate with my chemical engineering degree from Purdue. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was a given, and I had a professor. I always sat in the front so I wouldn't miss a word of what was being said and taught because I was <laughs> a student of par excellence. I was, I was with it. And he came up to me and he actually touched my forehead with his finger, his index finger, and said, I will fail you if it's the last thing I do. You're taking the seat that belongs to a man. Do you remember what I class cried. this was? Uh, it's interesting how one filters Yes. And I filtered a lot of that out because I had such angst and such anger. Of course, especially he I did this in violated. front of the whole class. Yeah, I felt violated. <sighs> it was it was it was so embarrassing. Yes. And it it touched at my heart because I promised my parents I would graduate. Now someone's going to fail me mm -hmm. because I'm a woman. Yeah. It just did not make sense, especially when you are 
uh, doing so well in your studies yes. for someone to make that decision. Yeah, yeah. So it was very interesting. He was not able to fail me because uh, I had A's and everything. Uh, so he gave me a B. Mm. But, you know, it was just amazing. Uh, you know, I just didn't didn't know that such feelings felt. I mean, men and women are all the same. We all yeah. have our own capabilities. And I found out that when I went to the engineer in that, those days they called it engineering drawing, the mm. course that we was one of the required ones, um, I felt very uncomfortable because they told me where to go sit. Everybody, all the guys went and sat at all the tables wherever they wanted. And they sat, they took me over and pulled me out of the whole mass of students coming mm -hmm. in and took me and put me in the corner of the room, way in the corner at the farthest side. And I felt so isolated. And there were some tables around me, and so the drawing tables. And I, I felt, well, uh, maybe I could you know, see if I could be nice to everyone. So I walk over to the table and the guys would look in the other direction. And the books that were written in those days were uh, less than adequate, uh, let's put it that way. I mean, now they have wonderful texts. In those days, it was really grim. And I had not had engineering drawing of any mm -hmm. kind because that's what they just teach at a girl's school. Sure. And the guys all did. So they were all set, and I was like floundering. I didn't know what they were even talking about. And I'd, I'd ask the TA, uh, could I ask a question? No. And I heard them telling, the TAs telling the guys, you're not to talk with her. So I was isolated totally by myself. That was the lowest grade I ever got. Mm. I think it was, uh, they gave me a a D or something, and I had to take it. I took it again because I had to ta take it again. It was uh, it was the most horrible experience because I'd never been isolated like that before, and willfully people would not assist. Nobody would raise a hand to help or explain, you know, what this aspect of what they're trying to do. I had no clue, mm -hmm. absolutely no clue. So uh, that was... That was a, a second early on situation that happened. And uh, I think things like that make you stronger Yeah. because I knew I had to do it myself. Did and you have anyone you could talk with about these things? No, I didn't. Um, I was the only one who really was taking any of mm -hmm. that kind of curriculum in those days, uh, only one in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and... There was one other uh, woman I saw once in the uh, orientation as a freshman, mm -hmm. and uh, I never saw her again. So she, <laughs> she graduated. She yeah. Well, uh, you know, if, when I was uh, uh, awarded the Outstanding uh, uh, Chemical Engineering uh, Chemical Engineer Award mm -hmm. in 2008, I think it was, uh, Oh, I went and looked at the picture of the class together. I never knew where they had it in the mm -hmm. chemistry school. So I went and I found it and I looked. I said, there's another woman there. Who is she? <laughs> so she, she was in the picture at least. But she was never huh. in my classes. How strange. Yeah, I thought that was extremely strange. And I thought, does she really belong in the picture? I mean, yeah. I knew I was there and I knew I graduated. But I thought, I don't remember. She was not in, definitely not in any of my classes. I was the only woman. Mm. There were, definitely. The one person that might have been able to relate to your situation was split off from you, it sounds like. Yeah. It, oh, uh, my goodness. Yeah, it was a very interesting experience, <laughs> but a growing experience. I imagine. I mean, I can only, I can't actually imagine what it must have been like to have the pressure of knowing that you needed to graduate, but to have so many barriers to that, that's really unfortunate. And it just makes you think about you know, generations and generations of women facing things like that. Well, it's, it really did start out when I walked in the Chem E building. I mean, that was I did before my other, but I didn't take it as a uh, as a rejection, uh, <laughs> like I did the other two things instances. But uh, when I was first in the building, I asked, "Where is the ladies' room?" Because I want to go to ladies' room. Sure. And uh, they said, we do not have a ladies' room. 
<laughs> you have to go across the campus right over there, and I think it was the double E building or something, I don't know, whichever one it was that they mentioned. And I said, you don't have a ladies' room? No, we don't. I said, but I see ladies working as, and she said, well, they go there to go to the ladies' room. Wow. And so I said, I did. Oh, that doesn't sound right. You know, speaking up like I shouldn't have. <laughs> well, that's probably what kept you going that far is that you did speak up. <laughs> I did speak up. And, and lo and behold, they informed me after a couple weeks that they did have a ladies' room now. They took a broom, not a broom closet, what do they call it? Uh, they had a narrow door only about... Uh, two and a half feet uh, that was wide. You had to go sideways into the door. Mm-hmm. It was a closet in uh, in which they had a, a big dirty tub for washing out mops. Oh, so it was like a janitorial type Janitorial, closet. there we go. Oh my goodness. That's, that's a great term for it. It was a janitorial closet. And so what they had done was if you came in sideways in the door here and then you went sideways between the, the big tub with the dirty uh, mop in it, or mops, plural. Uh, there was a, 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 a toilet there, and you squeeze sideways to that, <laughs> and then you could use the ladies' room. Wow. So that was... <laughs> so questionable whether that was actually better than going to another building. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it was in the basement. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Well, um... Thinking back, I guess, to your classes and and the faculty and, I guess, administrators that you might have interacted with, did you have any mentors or people at Purdue who encouraged you in your program or outside of it? Yeah. uh, Unfortunately, the uh, the professors, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, there was a, they were a product of the times. Mm -hmm. And so they were very occupied with the, with the young men. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the class, and uh, I was just sort of an outlier there. And even when I went in to look at curriculum, I was t- treated in a lighter fashion, uh, such that, well, you don't have to take um, the PE exam or anything like that mm-hmm. because, you know, it's just chemical engineering. Just <laughs> how do you like that? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so... Uh, it was uh, it was just a, a, a reflection of the times and mm-hmm. how it was. Uh, it was disappointing because I didn't know anything. I truly had nobody to turn to, really. When I think I never mm-hmm. really thought about it, but there really wasn't anyone to turn to. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just a matter of persisting. And as I tell students now, um, and they're having some very deep problems and not. Purdue, they're doing a good job, but some of the other mm-hmm. universities, the deans will call, deans of engineering will call and ask and say, I have trouble uh, about my women students, I'm losing them, would you come and mm-hmm. talk with them, mm-hmm. and uh, they're some in some cases they're overwhelmed, and other times they had third world country professors mm-hmm. that treated them like chattel, and these are very bright young oh, women, dear. yeah, this was, and this was in the late 90s in early 2000s wow. that they were experiencing this. And I, I would tell the students, uh, the young women, uh, do not try to solve the world problems of the whole world. Just address mm-hmm. what you're doing at that moment. Focus totally and put one, and then I would demonstrate one foot in front of the other. Mm-hmm. Heel to toe, heel to toe. Mm-hmm. You're focusing on that, and that will get you through. Mm-hmm. And I've had other women come up in the Society of Women Engineers at the national conferences and uh, actually come up and thank me and say, you know what I do? I've walked that one toe, toe to heel, toe to heel, and focused, and it works. That's wonderful. And I thank you. Yeah. So it does make a difference. I imagine so. I just wish you'd had someone, a Roberta, for you to say that to, to say that to, to you, you when you were going through those things. Yeah, that's why I spent so much of my time and effort and scholarships and things mm-hmm. like that and endowments, so so that other young women don't have to go through that. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's it's. I I can only imagine how many people have 
been ready to quit and then just thought, well, if she could do it back when she was the only woman, surely I can do it when I'm a handful of women, you know. No, it is true. And that, <laughs> there, is a, there is a mentality yeah. to that because I, I walk with sticks and I walk in the mountains in the yeah. Santa Monica Mountains. And the doctor says it's either the sticks and walking or else a wheelchair. So I'm a sticks. Right, <laughs> right. Sticks. And I'll have people stop me on the trail and say, you're my inspiration. I figure if you could do it with your bandages on your legs and your head, you're right. Absolutely. I can do it. If you could do it and you can come every day, I can do it. So, <laughs> so much of it is attitude, isn't it? And and having the motivation to yeah, to persevere. True. So it's yeah. true. Um, when you were when you were a student at Purdue, was mm-hmm. there a Society of, of Women Engineers? There? Yes, we did have uh-huh. a chapter. It's Society of Women Engineers had just started, uh-huh. and I signed up, and I think I signed up as an officer of something or other of, of doing. And there weren't many. There were some women, but not many. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got awfully busy with. Uh, making sure that I was going to pass those courses that weren't going to pass me. (laughs) And so I really didn't, it was only to start with, I signed up and, you know, they weren't doing anything. And so Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to sit there and chat for meetings. And in those days it was, you know, just a different kind of world. So I I did did not uh, continue Mm -hmm. giving my time toward, dedicating my time towards, it was only afterwards when I when I entered the workforce finally after that's a different story <laughs> uh, that uh, my company sent me to recruit the aerospace corporation sent me to recruit at the Society of Women Engineers National Conference so I went to that and I that was in a hotel and would, actually it was in Disneyland I think uh, and I came in the top floor and there was I looked down the escalator and I saw where they were doing the registration forgive me if I cry <laughs> That's okay. but I looked down and I saw these women engineers down there and they looked just like me yeah. <laughs> there was somebody finally like me <laughs> you had a community finally I yeah. had a community I could be part of and it meant a real lot to me. I bet. I came down that escalator and I just will never forget that feeling of there are other ones like me. (laughs) Yeah, you were not alone anymore. Not alone. a huge powerful feeling. It was very powerful and it was was wonderful. I'm so glad. It was wonderful. I, I suspect that there are many women in the organization who had a moment like that when they first realized Oh, there are more of us. Yeah, you know, I'm not. A, I'm not alone. Exactly. Yeah. Then I went on to be national president of the society. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, it had a profound effect, on you, and you had a profound effect on it. So, um, well, that's just wonderful. So, I guess um, just backing up a little bit, while you were at Purdue, yes. I know you mentioned you graduated in 1960. That is correct. Um, what were your next steps immediately after graduating? What did you do? Well, the interesting part was actually, which influenced what, what I did afterwards, was the process of, do you were graduating, companies are coming in to interview. Yes. And uh, we did not have, uh, Purdue did not have a, uh, a strong area in that particular venue of, of rec- in the recruitment area. Um, and especially me, I didn't even know anything was going on. I just did filled out the forms and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and it happened that one of the, uh, I wasn't getting any responses uh, and I didn't think anything about it because I didn't know if I was supposed to yeah. receive responses. I didn't know what the process was or what I was just doing what the other guys were talking about doing and I said, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to sign up for interviews too. And uh, one of the C students <laughs> Is the one who I still remember him. I I thought it took a C student to be able to figure the whole thing out. He said, "Roberta, he says you got the grades and you got everything. You know how many interviews you've been to so far?" I said, "None." He said, "None." Oh, I've had ten. I said, "Oh, I said, no, I just uh, I haven't had any invitations for mm. interviews." And he said brilliantly. You didn't put your first name down on that form, did you? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, yeah, my name's Roberta Uh Benizak. 
And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. Put your initial down. Mm. Don't put your first name down. Put your initial down. I said, really? But is that honest? He said, isn't your initial R? (laughs) And I said, yes, it is. And he said, use your initial. He was smart. He was smart. I said, he's a C student, but he's going to do well in industry because he sees the... The uh, you know he 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 un- analyzed it correctly, Isn't and um, and and I did get offers at that point to uh-huh. come for interviews, and uh, each interview that I was asked to come for, uh, I'd arrive with my suit on and everything, and all ready to interview, and the interviewer would jump up, the company representative would jump up from behind the desk, run to the door, put the arms out, spread them out across the doorway so that I could not walk in, and say, I'm so sorry, but we've already filled all of our vacancies. I won't take your time with an interview. To a person, they all did that. Oh, my goodness. Then it, that's why we had to create laws to, <laughs> that's, to keep I think, people from doing that. <laughs> but one company on the East Coast, they uh, saw our Dan Zag with all this wonderful knowledge that was going to yeah. in Kemi. And so I received a letter inviting me to come to the East Coast. Wow. I gave up two days of classes, which I didn't appreciate because I loved my classes at Purdue. Sure, <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and, and I knew my parents were paying for every penny of it, so right. it would meant a lot. And, and so I, I, I accepted, and I went uh, to interview. Uh, I was to meet down at the uh, turn, turning uh, for the picking up the luggage area, and uh, they had different accommodations in those days. And so I got down there to pick up my luggage, and uh, I see a man standing with a suit, the only one with a suit on. It's a man. He's standing over there. So, of course, I walked over to him, and I said, Sir... And he looked at me and said, no, in a very loud voice. And in those days, I mean, this was 1959 slash 60. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, this is, oh, my God, you know. Yeah, <laughs> said, yelling. We don't yell yeah. like that, you know. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. And I stepped back, and uh, now the luggage is uh, coming, and I get my suitcase. And I said, ha, huh. guy's still standing there. So I run quickly over with my suitcase in hand, and I said, Sir, I'm, and he yelled, even if it was possible, resonated through that whole area, no, (laughs) no. (laughs) And I said, what am I going to do? Okay, I go back and stand uh, where the rest, there were just a couple people there now. Now everybody's gone, and I'm standing there, and he's standing, there's a man, the same man, standing facing the wall. Mm. Not even facing up, but facing the wall. <laughs> and I thought, well, that must be the man that is supposed to greet me and t- bring me to the hotel and take me to the company. Uh-huh. And uh, he, sw- I come up behind him and I says, sir, I'm Roberta, I'm Roberta Manza. And he turned around and he, he said, you, with his finger, that index finger was very popular in those days. <laughs> <laughs> you lied. I looked at him. I said, sir, I never lie. I never lie. My parents have taught me. I always tell the truth. He said, you're a woman. (laughs) And I said, yes, I am. But I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer graduating from Purdue University in chemical engineering. And he said, you lied. He said, well, you can get on a plane, next plane, and go back. And I said, no. I took a day off from classes to do this part of it, and I'm, I'm not going to waste my time. I came to see your process department. I have a graduate course in processing. So mm-hmm. I said, I'd like to uh, see. Hmm. He said, well, there's no interview. He said, you could have lunch and then get on a plane and go back. I said, fine. And he said, so sleep in, and we'll pick you up for lunch at noon. I said, fine. Thank you, sir. Okay, dropped me off at the hotel. Noon time, there's a nice big long car out there, and a gentleman takes me, puts me in the den, and he drives over to the big company with the huge glass, all glass in front. He opens the big glass door, and I'm following him in, and he says, 
this is the ladies' room. <laughs> I thought I flew across the country from Purdue <laughs> to the East Coast so I could look at their ladies' room. I don't think so. <laughs> you know? And I thought, I'm going to ignore that completely. Mm-hmm. He's going on and on about this is where the secretaries. And so I'm, I'm already looking. I see a door that actually says process department on it. Mm-hmm. Very excited. And I, I go over and I put my hand on the doorknob. I'm ready to open the door. And he says, take your hand off that doorknob. I said, I beg your pardon? He says, he says, women aren't allowed in there. And I said, I'm not a woman. I'm an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> he said, women are not allowed in there. And he actually physically took my hand off the door. I said, but I have graduate courses. I am dressed appropriately. I have flat shoes to climb any kind of ladders you have. I have as a suit with pants, which was very unusual in those days. Uh-huh. But I did have that suit that allowed me to to climb ladders yeah. or do whatever, walk on grading, makes no difference. I'm I'm familiar with chemical engineering. No, women are not allowed in there. And he took me by the elbow then, and he directs me, and he says, this is the library. Now, I love libraries. You yes. know that very well, sure. <laughs> and sure. I support it. I, <laughs> I think it's libraries are very technical. <laughs> There's no question about it. But I studied chemical engineering. Yes. Yes. They said, well, we need somebody to sort through our card catalogs or something. And I said, oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. I, can I still see the process? Right. <laughs> no, no, you cannot go in there. Women not allowed. And I said, well, thank you very much. So and was I, this man who, who met you at the airport, he would, he would have been the supervisor or the hiring person for that position? I think he would have been. Uh-huh. He had the demeanor of such a person. The guy in the car uh, didn't, but then another fellow popped out from one of the doors, and I think he had a higher authority than the guy that picked me up at the the gentleman. Oh, so the man, was, let's put it that way, that picked me up at the, uh, at the hotel. Wow. And uh, it was... Uh, it was a real lesson, and they sent me a letter and offered me a position as uh, as the card, whatever you know. Whatever. For the library? Yes. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I, I studied chemical engineering at Purdue University, Slightly the best school in the country. For that. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I I said no, thank you. And my husband and I were were engaged and were planning uh-huh. to get married, anyhow. So we got married and. Um, uh, there were, there was just no way to break the barrier at that time. Mm-hmm. However, I did discover that uh, women who studied math, chemistry, and biology, uh, they got jobs. But when I talked about to them about what they did in my peer group, my era, uh, they were given very mean, not meaningful jobs. They mm-hmm. were, uh, they were very low level, and they were just happy to have the jobs. Mm-hmm. So uh, somehow or other, engineers scared the companies, the women engineers actually scared the companies mm. because we were a little forceful, like putting our hands on doorknobs mm-hmm. and things like right. that. Right, yeah. You <laughs> we weren't willing to just hide in the women's bathroom. <laughs> That's <is> correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Wow. Um, so, so I guess looking, your next step then was you, you became married to John, who you'd met as a fellow student at Purdue, right? Yes, wonderful, wonderful man. <laughs> and he's also an engineering, I think? Yes, is that right? he's an aero astro okay. engineer. That's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, what did you decide to do after you had faced all of these barriers to employment? What was your next step? My next step was to lick my wounds, I think I would have to mm-hmm. say, because uh, I realized actually, in looking back at myself, uh, I'd have to do an introspective because I always wondered why I was so reticent to plunge into anything, mm-hmm. um, because I had been rejected at the visceral level. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything that I knew or thought of had been rejected. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the ego goes down. Uh, I was pleased and happy, though, that we have three wonderful children. I was thrilled about that. That That is the thrill of my life, mm-hmm. my three wonderful children, our three wonderful children. Yes. <laughs> my husband was traveling in business. <laughs> he contributed some. <laughs> <laughs> some. So, so, yeah, uh, uh, it, there was no... 
entree, and the only thing I could do was go in the grocery store and talk with women about with detergent. They And when I tried to t- even have a conversation that was a little bit technical, it just blew everybody away and decided that wasn't any good, so I just was a, turned into a more quiet person. This was kind of that that time right before, like, whenever a lot of women's rights organizations were really fighting in the 60s. This was prior to that, and um, there was such a kind of conservative feel to the 50s, which might have been because of that post-war sentiment, I don't know, but um, thinking about you kind of hit that exact moment when it was extremely difficult, I think, for a highly qualified woman to get ahead because there was a feeling that you know, we've we've gone off to war and we deserve these jobs. You know? <laughs> well, it's true. It's the same like the ch- uh, seats in the in the classroom. Yeah, you know, it exactly. was the same uh, same type of thing. Who do you think you are, and what do you? Why do you think you should be able to come in and think you're going to be an engineer? Right, right. And uh, it was uh, so. It was challenging, but the I realized that I had been beaten down as low as I could, and what forced me to even do the analysis was when my husband said. Uh, our our younger uh, younger son uh, was already in high school, and I uh, he said, "Did you see the paper?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I read the paper." He said, "Well, did you see about this reentrant woman in engineering program uh, that uh, the National Science Foundation is putting on?" I said, "Really? How nice!" He said, "Well, you're going to go," and I said, "No, I'm not going to go." And at I might constant iteration to my poor husband saying, you know, no, I'm not going to go to that, is I realized then that I had been rejected at the most visceral level. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't going to do that to myself again. Right. <laughs> right. And he, but he knew, he knew that you needed that, right? Yeah. Because yes. I can't imagine for someone with the level of intelligence and determination that you had to do so well in your studies <laughs> with all those barriers and then to not be able to get a job. And, I mean, it's, it's of course, extremely admirable that you stayed home with your children and you raised your family, but yeah. how were you intellectually stimulated during that time? I mean, this is, you're, you're clearly above average intelligence, <laughs> so I'm wondering how you, how did you deal with those needs you had to be stimulated intellectually? Yeah, it was interesting because I tried to engage my husband in mm-hmm. what's happening in his workplace. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I, I don't think he particularly appreciated my pride, but <laughs> I, I don't think he realized, poss- you know, I there was. it took me a while to analyze and understand uh, that I had been uh, totally inexorably rejected. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but we did have uh, technical conversations. I would read the the technical magazines that he'd have coming in the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just was hungry. Yeah. I was hungry to learn. Yeah. And, um, but it wasn't threatening either what, what I was doing, whereas going to the National Science Foundation Reentrant Women Program left an opening for some severe rejection. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, he talked me into it. I mean, mm-hmm. he really was hard press. <laughs> it was like a basketball game, the hard press. Yeah. And uh, I did uh, go to it, and uh, for which I'm forever grateful. Mm-hmm. And um, they had a, a, a situation where you did internships. It was it was a year long program, full time. And they give lots of tests. But what was so interesting is uh, when. Uh, my fear of rejection uh, was when one of the head professors at uh, uh, Cal State Northridge called me in and said, "We need to. T- I need to talk with you, Roberta." And I thought, "Oh my God, I can't be rejected again. Right, I don't think right. I can handle it." Yes. And so I sat down, ready for rejection. And uh, he said, "There's something I need to ask you to do." And I said, "What is that?" He said, well, you, I want to first tell you that the professors are all, from all the disciplines, are really impressed with your ability to do such a great job. And uh, you're, you're just a, a, a wonderful student. And he said, but I'm going to ask you to step down from the program. And I thought, oh, my God, it's happening again. Right. <laughs> it's happening again. He said... Uh, and he saw the look of horror on my face, I guess, and, and shock. And he said, 
Oh, no, no, no. He said, you mean still part of the program? No, you're ruining the curve. You don't realize <laughs> we can't give anybody Bs because your A is so high. Oh, that's so funny. Everybody else is getting a C yes. and Ds. He said it to you. <laughs> <laughs> you were advanced for the, the program, it yeah, sounds like. And, and what happened was actually the training that I got at Purdue, although that was many years earlier, 19 years earlier, uh, it was so great and so wonderful mm -hmm. uh, that it stayed with me. That's incredible. Everything came back. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, what they were teaching, I thought, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got that. Know that. Been there. Done that. <laughs> and I was ruining the curve. They said they really can't continue with you in the classes because we can't have a curve. Oh, dear. Okay. So that was that was how I reentered. Then I did the internship uh, at, uh, at aerospace, the Aerospace Corporation, bless their heart. And I thought, whoa, I'm going into the satellite world, the space world, and I have a chemical engineering degree. Well, that's when the discovery comes that any engineering degree from Purdue is the best. It teaches you to think. Yes. And that's what a company wants is someone who can think. Mm -hmm. And they certainly certainly got it and uh, they immediately wanted to hire me on full time. And they Wonderful. had they brought me in at the end when they did the graduation thing from the National Science Foundation uh -huh. and gave me my, my oh, diploma for so having completed nice. it. <laughs> They didn't mention the fact that everybody else that I would have been they exiled, not exiled, but told to go ahead and work full time because uh, they, you didn't we, need the program. They, no, I didn't. they could tell that you didn't need it. That's, yeah. I think, a, a wonderful honor to know that they recognized that that you were already prepared. For I was prepared, for, <laughs> and Purdue does that. And when I go and speak with students, I tell them your mm -hmm. engineering degree speaks for itself, and if it's from Purdue. It goes beyond speaking for itself. Mm -hmm. It says what discipline you've been endowed with and the knowledge that you've been, the tools that you've been given. Uh, it. I will hire always a Purdue grad mm -hmm. because I know that they they have all the tools that they need. That's fantastic. Yeah, so it's it's a blessed Purdue. <laughs> well, I, I, Purdue is grateful to have you as one of our alums because I think that... Um, you know, we've made strides with women engineers, of course, but there's there's still a ways to go. And it's so inspirational, I think, for women who still struggle in these male-dominated professions to see the, the women who had it really much harder than they do today and, and to see that even though we have work to do, there has been a, a lot of work that had to happen to get us to this point. That's true. Know, so. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done, very yes. much so. Yes. When I talk with some of the students that I'm called specially to talk with, and, and they're in tears saying that they're, they're leaving the field of engineering. And these are very bright women. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe the third world country professors feel threatened. Yes, that that's these definitely. young women are smarter than they are. It can be a big issue. I think you're right. If um, there are different interactions between men and women in the countries that the professors are coming from, that that clearly is something that we have to look at because we don't want to, you know, not have people from all over the world. We want the best faculty, Absolutely. but they need to be acclimated to the cultures here, and that's. I can see where that would be a serious problem for women to deal with. I, it I is. can't even imagine. Yeah, they're treated like one once said with a chattel. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, possibly yeah. even a similar attitude to what you saw, which is you're not. They're not going to allow you to do better than the men in this course. You know. True. Um, Very true. Well, you've given um, many, many talks and presentations about women in engineering to a variety of audiences, and you've also served in several leadership capacities. Um, you've created scholarships for women and engineering students, and you've been a role model for women in the profession. And I'm just curious, what would you say has motivated you the most to give back to women in this way? I guess I would go uh, say that uh, I, I've, the, it's a visceral feeling of mine that I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. Mm -hmm. I survived and was successful and I'm thrilled that this this I was fortunate enough and blessed to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to see any other young women 
I try to talk with them, and uh, I'll stay after, and, and I'll wait, because I usually am traveling to the different universities, and I'll stay after, and I will I will talk to them. As mm-hmm. long as they're wanting to need to talk with me, I will talk with them and give them my honest opinion and help them with some guidance and thoughts and mm-hmm. tricks of of uh, uh, how, how one would think about things and um, things like that, uh, uh, and and there's a, there's a feedback too. It, it's there's a positive that uh, something that you just can't put a value on when later in years you hear that you've touched someone's life. Mm-hmm. Uh, my son was the one who. Uh, I didn't accept calls at work. <laughs> mm-hmm. But when my son called, my older son, I was, uh, I thought, oh my goodness, something terrible must have happened. Mm-hmm. And his first words to me were, why didn't you tell me, mother? And I said, tell you? Tell you what? Why didn't you tell me? I said, well, what was I supposed to tell you? You didn't tell me about going to the different schools and talking with them. And I said, yes, I did. You told me it was boring and you didn't want to hear my stories <laughs> anymore. I said, so I stopped telling you. But yeah, oh, I did that. And, he, and I said, well, why are you why are you calling me to say this? And he said, well, you know, I'm new at IBM. And I was standing at the bottom of this big staircase, and one of the vice presidents was coming down. And so I was just sort of standing there talking with another um, person that I work with, and she came up to me and said, "Um, is your last name Glider? Are you Chris Glider? And he says, yes, I am. And um, she uh, she said to him, it was the she vice president, she said to him, do you know a Roberta Glider? And Chris said to me, he said, I told her, that's my mother. (laughs) And she said, well, will you give a message to your mother, please, and tell her to thank her very much. I thank her from the bottom of my heart because she was at my high school and she spent a half hour talking with me about engineering and that I could do it. And when I got done talking with her, that's what I was going to do. And she said she's the reason that I'm an engineer and that I'm a vice president at here. Isn't that incredible? And I was, I started crying on the yeah. phone. <laughs> what an amazing thing to realize that you've touched someone all this time without even knowing. Not knowing, you know. yeah. And I think that all of us through life touch people's lives and we really never ever get to hear of it. And I thought, mm-hmm. well, this is this is like a miracle yeah. that, uh, that I should hear back in such a coincidental way right. that uh, that someone remembers to remember my yes. name was blew me away that a high school amazing, student because I, I don't know if someone just spoke to me once in high school if I would remember their full name it yeah. clearly made a, a very strong impression so. yeah well, I think I gave her a business card too though maybe that that's wasn't great. for me <laughs> no that's that's so wonderful and probably there are many more women like her who heard you that you don't even know you know that are out there so that's fantastic um there was something you talked about in a previous interview that I think might have been done with with Purdue for you a few years back about how you were involved in a course called Engineering 194. Does this sound familiar? Oh, yes. Um, that uh, that was for the freshman uh, uh, women in engineering. Is that what it was? Okay. Yeah. I saw that you, you talked about how you had done some lecturing for this course and yes, that your husband absolutely. told you what a great job you did after hearing you speak all, all over <laughs> on everything but that was like your best your best one ever so I was just curious what was the course so it was a women in engineering yes. course okay yes it was a women in engineering course well, and it was perfect. and it was uh, certainly rewarding to speak with the students and it uh, it was uh, it was very good uh, you know I I go back to the Outstanding Chemical Engineer Award and my yeah. Yeah, interesting experience I had uh, that uh, was jarring uh, mm-hmm. because I was asked uh, when I was I was asked they had they put it, the whole auditorium together and, and, and only the top students that were there and asked good questions and and the question was what do you remember most uh, about Purdue University. 
And I said, the only thing that pops in my mind right off the bat, it wasn't the ladies' room, it was not It was the, the professor who was telling me he was going to fail me. Mm. <laughs> I said, yeah. that is, unfortunately, it's emblazoned on my brain. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, uh, and they, and I, I said, you know, well, I'm not going to tell you. I said, you don't want to hear it, what, in answer to the question, you know, mm-hmm. what was you remember. Uh, let me tell you something very pleasant and fun. <laughs> no, we want to hear, yeah, we want to hear. <laughs> and, and that's when uh, I related uh, the, uh, the threat of failure. <laughs> and uh was interesting is one of the professors uh came up to me while I was getting my papers together at the lectern and uh, said, was that me? And I was horrified beyond words. Was it? And I was, and I looked at him and I said, he's dead. <laughs> Very mean tone, which I'm not used to doing. <laughs> he's dead. Because <laughs> it was so many years ago. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, and, and 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 I was just so agitated because I thought that means he's done it to somebody. That means right. Not only has he done it, but he thought that was okay. Yeah, yeah. that he that he could have done it to you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, and so I walk out the back way carrying my briefcase with my notes in it and stuff, and I was still agitated. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, and so I stopped, and I was I was looking at uh, some of the class pictures. And another professor came up to me, and I, I says, Roberta, thank you for retro speaking. And I said, it's been my pleasure, my honor, and my pleasure to speak for these excellent students and um, in some way motivate them and help them. And he said, well, I have a question. And I said, certainly. What, you know, what, what, what do you have? And he says, was that me <laughs> that did that? And I looked at him, I thought, I won't tell you the words that went through my mind. I said, here's number two who came up. That's just almost, I mean, I I wish that this was really staggering. But in fact, I'm not all that surprised after hearing that you were, you know, one of two women in the program. Unfortunately, I mean, we know of of professors who still today will kind of give people that introductory uh, you know, lecture on like, look to your left and your right. What have you? Uh, well, you we got that one. To be here, right? <laughs> but true. to single out someone because of their gender, especially whenever they're leading the class, it's yeah. that takes uh, a t- certain mindset for sure. But um, it, and I thought, well, now there's two of them. They know that there's plenty that have done that to yeah. the young women. Well, and the one good thing about the one who did say it is at least he was forthright and honest about it. That's you never true. knew that these other people were thinking they were going to fail you. <laughs> Just luckily you proved them that they could But couldn't. they said it to someone. Yeah, they yeah. said it. They verbally said the same it's thing. It's horrifying. I mean... So it scares you. How many... To look back on your life and you want to have made positive differences, right? But to look Absolutely. back and wonder, well, how many people did I dis- discourage? That's that's truly sad to yeah. me. But uh, but that was the that is the rarity because I find that uh, the you know the professors are so uh, helpful and yeah. uh, and uh, they cherish the students that they're teaching mm-hmm. and uh, so there's a whole mindset that has changed. Now the other schools I can't speak for them because right. I only know Purdue because I will come to the classes and sit in sometimes and some, once I was here and graduate students they had me come and talk to the graduate students mm-hmm. and that was uh, really a very nice experience and they were very interested mm-hmm. in hearing about um, about my experiences with the Aerospace Corporation and the varied type of people I worked with and mm-hmm. the excitement I had with uh, the various programs that I worked on or that I was in charge of and very, very stimulating, and, the, and they were very excited about uh, getting that information. That's and the great. professor was the one who went, stepped outside the room, and said, "I heard Roberta's here. Could you have her come in and talk with my students?" Oh, how nice! That's how I uh, ended up talking to the grad students, and and it was my pleasure because they and gave them some hints about resumes, and mm-hmm. I. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes. I always have hints for the students because they mm-hmm. they absorb it. It's yeah. wonderful. Helps them along. That's that's fantastic. It's really inspirational that you continue to do those things. Um, 
you may have already answered this question in some of the other things we've talked about, but I wanted to find out what you consider to be your greatest challenge, either from your life or your education or your work, and how did you overcome that? I think the biggest challenge in in retrospect uh, was actually myself. I was I was my biggest obstacle because I allowed myself to be really stripped of all dignity of mm-hmm. you know being rejected. You do feel like you're truly standing there, and you just are with nothing. Mm-hmm. You feel like you've been it's all been taken away from you. Uh, so I think my biggest obstacle was myself, mm-hmm. and you know, when I allowed myself to step back and look at myself and say, "Well, why are you feeling like this? Wh- what uh, what led to this?" and actually analyzed uh, the components of of what it was. It was fear of rejection, mm-hmm. and I think that that's probably a very a common thing maybe mm-hmm. and that you'll find with everybody because we've all faced rejection and yeah. we all handle it differently mm-hmm. and uh, to me it was like I said it was very visceral because of my it was it was it was my education that was being right. questioned also so it was I myself as the obstacle and once I got through that then it was uh, all well, uh, there were a few things at work, I have to admit, mm-hmm. that uh, I had great dignity about myself, and I'm one of those running the meetings, the technical meetings, and uh, someone comes up and asks me to get them a cup of coffee. <laughs> I said, no, you have two legs. You can go help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so it gives one the confidence that yes. uh, once you uh, get rid of fear, and I think fear is uh, uh, fear is the big obstacle, and it was myself that was the obstacle. <laughs> Well, I just, I I mean, you're a hero for me because you pushed through all of those obstacles and did what you wanted to anyway. And, you know, I just think you, you can't be hard on yourself because you were trying to protect yourself from all of that rejection. Sure, I was protecting. And I think about how, you know, you continued to speak with your husband about his work and read the trade journals and give go out and give talks to, to young people and... You know, you were doing everything you could in that society at the time to remain active as a woman engineer, and that's something to be proud of. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, you've received so many recognitions and awards throughout your life and your career. Are there any that have particular meaning or significance for you? The, uh, it's interesting that uh, you ask that. It's because engineering is, is uh, in my heart and soul. Uh, it uh, was when I was, uh, in 2008, uh, I was the seventh woman in 102 years uh, to uh, receive the uh, Outstanding Chemical Engineer Award. Mm. It was a highlight beyond highlights. Uh, totally unexpected. Uh, didn't didn't expect it I had usually for awards you're asked by someone to please provide some information about because you're the only one who knows about yourself mm-hmm. you know they tell me about you know give me your CV you know mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I had no clue and actually it was through the mail that I received a letter it was interesting because I was sitting at the kitchen table never forget it and uh, I had a letter from Purdue and I thought we just gave a donation, sweetheart. I said to my <laughs> husband, uh, "I said, uh, oh. I was, I, yeah. I'm ready to start ripping the top to rip it and have to throw it in the trash." Mm-hmm. And I said, "Well, I'm going to see how they're asking for money this time." Mm-hmm. Uh, and we give voluntarily now; nobody has to ask. <laughs> but, <laughs> but nevertheless, in that in that era, yeah. uh, in tw- twenty, that's what started everything going. Was in two thousand eight or seven. And uh, I opened it up, and it was an announcement that I had been selected. I couldn't believe it. I said, how could that be? No one's asked me for any information because I've nominated people for different things, and Mm -hmm. I always had all that good information handy. And I didn't understand that at all. 
And it wasn't until I actually came to Purdue and was with the professors, and I said, huh, I'll tell you something that's really, I really would need an answer to because I'm just so, I don't understand. I said, how did you get the information about me? Because you're fully informed. And I said, we'll never tell you, but we know more about you than you know about yourself. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it I mean, was, you clearly, your reputation was visible to them, you know? Yeah. So you never, you never knew that you were already on their radar. I had and no idea. And so it, it, to me, that was the, the award of all awards. That's um, wonderful. It, uh, was, it was so meaningful and... Um, it, uh, there were words just to find me that that was that was uh, that was the start of everything else and that mm-hmm. it took place and uh, the uh, many wonderful awards that I've been receiving I've I'm very humbled by by that I just in fact when I in 2016 uh, when I Women in Technology International with the Hall of Fame that I was nominated for. My company actually nominated me, which shocked oh, me. that's wonderful. Absolutely shocked me. Uh-huh. I didn't know that the Aerospace Corporation was going to... I had no... Of course, they have all my information, so there was no problem. But however, they had someone assigned that called me and said, Roberta, I need all of your information that you have. We're going to make a... Because we're going to have this nomination go in. I said, yeah. If, uh, you know, <laughs> well, that's... Uh, I said, certainly, I'll give you I have a ton of papers are you sure and oh yeah oh How yeah fantastic. they had a, a, a person who's proficient at that sort of thing to take all this information and establish it and put it together for a nomination huh. and I was <laughs> I thought wow this is incredible were you still involved with aerospace at that time or had you yes already? okay uh-huh. yeah no 2004 I took quote-unquote retirement which uh-huh. was which was really not a good decision because I continued working oh. and I worked more than full times more than 2,000 hours you know 2,400 oh, wow. hours a year for the first several years wow. because they they needed me and they wanted me I just didn't want to work for this guy who was a woman hater uh-huh. <laughs> I just didn't want to deal with that kind of persona uh-huh. and so I picked up my briefcase and I went and I said I want to retire so I took I didn't think about any of the other uh, considerations and I have people that now when I'm at my office uh, at my desk in the office because uh, I'm still working wow. at the age of 79 That's <laughs> and I, they will ask about retirement and I said well don't do what I did because that was precipitous uh-huh. I should have known better because they had financial ramifications yes. that were I would have uh, gotten to more raises. I got the worst yes. computer in, that they had in the company. Oh I goodness. mean, when you retire, you retire. But I was working more than full time for for at least four to five years. Wow! Yeah, and, and so it was uh, it was a good experience to do that. Yes. And I continue working as available. I tell them, <laughs> and as needed by you. Good. That's, good. That's so, a good combination. Yeah, and so they put, my, and they put my name in for this wonderful award, and and then I was informed that I I was selected as a recipient, yes. which absolutely blew me away. That's fantastic. And then they said, "Well, you need a video," and I thought, "Video? Oh my goodness! I can't afford to have a video made. Those are fifteen, twenty thousand dollars oh, <laughs> to, to do yes. something like that." <laughs> so, so I turned to the company. I thought, "Well, they nominated me. I would, right. I would ask them if they have the resources, and they yes, did. That's good. <laughs> and that video that's on YouTube it's is very nice. I it, enjoyed." It, yeah. Oh, I, because yeah. I, I, it was the company that made it great. It's I mean, they did a great well job. I thought I was thankful, and it didn't cost me a penny. That's good. That's good, too. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. Oh, I'm sorry um, I diverged. <laughs> no, no, that's that's great. I just have a couple questions left because I want to give you time to talk about things that you'd like to talk about. Um, but kind of coming, I guess, more full circle to where we are today, so we... We chatted a little bit about this, but women today really still face a lot of challenges just in terms of, like, lesser pay for the same jobs or um, in some fields there's still, you know, barriers to entering, like, even if they allow you in, there's kind of the the sense of not belonging. Like I would say in certain aspects of the military, for example, um, what do you think about 
these challenges that women still face today and where we still have to go for women in the country? It's a very serious subject, and it's very important uh, that young women be acquainted with all of the aspects of it. Um, there, I've been asked many times, uh, have we, are, are we there yet? And I say, we are and we aren't. Mm -hmm. The uh, women, technical women, um, have have a barrier that uh, is is seems to not have disappeared. Mm -hmm. There is, certainly is not the rejection, the uh, outward rejection that there is. There are many men who are very supportive mm -hmm. uh, of their women, uh, technical women, and uh, so it's uh, it's very positive in some instances. Uh, like, but the, the other side of the coin is that many women. Uh, decide to work for very small companies mm. uh, because they feel it's more family-like, which is not really a good reason to do it mm -hmm. because what you find, I found in counseling a lot of women when I went to different um, organizations that asked me to come and talk, and uh, the small companies are very difficult because there aren't many technical women to start mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. the engineers, and then to be in a small company where you truly are the only one, mm -hmm. and you ha all you need is one bully in that company. And I've talked to the women who had been bullied, and uh, it's not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I. I, I think I think of the young woman that was uh, hired fresh out of, from uh, in Texas of, for the oil industry, mm -hmm. and she was chemical engineering, of course. Uh, and they brought her to Bakersfield, California, and uh, f and she was going to be in charge of the en entire group of all men rednecks. Mm -hmm. Now the rednecks being, mm -hmm. you know, they're not educated particularly not necessarily maybe they are but they there's no uh, understanding of the broader world they have their own little yes. redneck world uh, it ended up being very bad she was fresh out they did not the company was not um, thoughtful in their process they thought well she's 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 a grad she can take care of herself mm -hmm. no such thing uh, they didn't prepare her in any way for management, number one, much less being out in an oil field and having rednecks being reporting to mm -hmm. her. Uh, so she was in a very bad straits when I, I talked with her. Uh, she had just had her grandmother come join her. She had a little tiny four-by-four four little hut that, like they had for the guys. Oh, wow. And uh, she was very concerned because they broke into her into her uh, cab little cabin, the mini cabin, and uh, took her underwear and hung it out all over the place and uh, said things to her that uh, were totally inappropriate. She told her management, and I said, uh, well, if it's too hot in the kitchen, get out of it. Wow. No support. Uh, she was beside herself, and she came to my my. It wasn't a lecture. It was a talk. Mm -hmm. uh, and she waited. She wanted to talk with me, and she says, what do I do? And I said, okay, first thing that you're going to do is you're going to look at the people. Do you do, do you deal with others outside of that? She said, yeah, the, the uh, different companies that provide supplies and things like that, and some of the technical companies that do some special things. I said, great. Do you have a good relationship with them? Uh, yes, I do. I said, great. I said, now what you're going to do is go home and you're going to write yourself a letter of recommendation that you would like to receive from those people. Cite the things that they have would have to say about you because that reflects your interaction with them. Document it in the, in the, and give it to them, and you're going to do that for all of them. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be very special. Each one is special. And you can say, when you see them the next time, you're going to give them a copy of this and say, uh, I really would like a recommendation letter would you would you all do that for me and here's here's some information on me mm -hmm. now what you're going to give them is a letter you'd like to see 
mm-hmm. and because they are going to copy every word that you write mm-hmm. <laughs> and sign their mm-hmm. names because they don't want to have to work. Right. And if they agree with what they see, they'll, they'll yeah. sign it. And you have those letters now. Now you have them all in your hand, and mm-hmm. you get them, have your grandma send it out so that it's they are protected and have copies made of them. And I said, and then you will gracefully and very professionally resign. Mm-hmm. But you talk with these companies, and if you can go for interviews, it's good to have a job before you say goodbye to this yeah. company. Because, But now you're going to be in a position, you know, that you have options. Mm-hmm. You're going to go to them, and you're going to be able to maybe get a job from one of those companies. And if not, they have friends because mm-hmm. they like what, do, what kind of work you do. And you certainly uh, have a lot of real-life experiences here, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And your grandma can go home, and you don't have to live in that little (laughs) four-by-four. And uh, she uh, she went, and uh, she did do that. It did sound like an impossible situation situation. If, if you have no support from above you for changing it. That's that's really all she could do, I think, because... Yeah, I sat for a minute thinking about it. Yeah. What can she do? This is impossible. Yeah. She should get out of there as soon as possible. So that's mm-hmm. when I came upon the idea that she should, you know, do this immediately as each one of those people mm-hmm. come that she's going to get a recommendation letter from. And that's your exit ticket Yeah, is, yeah. is to have uh, those people aware. You got the letters. Now you can even leave if you want but Mm -hmm. it's better if you but you do it in a dignified manner when you leave you don't you already told them what was going on they did not care Mm -hmm. so and then there are all these organizations that you know theoretically the company also has relationships with that they realize that she has worked so well with them, you know, it's not just an issue with her. That is good. <laughs> exactly. And it sounds like very good advice. Um, speaking of which, my next question was, if you could give young Roberta some advice <laughs> for the future, <laughs> what would it. you have told young Roberta? <laughs> oh, boy, for, uh, for the future, for where I am now mm-hmm. or way like back if, when? <laughs> like if you, let's say... Um, Let's say 10-year-old Roberta. What would you say to 10-year-old Roberta? Oh, I'd say continue doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. My father was, when I was about 10 years old, my father was building a garage, and uh, he let me get involved with the building of a garage because he designed it from, he he, he didn't know, I mean, he's not an engineer. He's a steel worker. He's not educated, Uh but he was a very good carpenter. He taught himself. So he was going to build the garage. So I got became part of the project. Mm-hmm. And the, the reason I hone in on it is because I had to think a long time about uh, where was my influence in engineering because there was a gentleman who approached me at one of the uh, SWE conferences and uh, said, I want to interview you because I'm trying to get data mm-hmm. uh, on, as to what were the motivations for going into uh, engineering. And I... I had to really dig and think, what was the thing that really tipped me into feeling inclined without really even recognizing that that's Mm -hmm. where I was aiming? Mm -hmm. Uh, It was because of working with my father uh, and building the garage that gave me a feeling of, I guess, confidence Mm -hmm. that one could build things and that you measure things and that it all fits together. And and, uh, it was very satisfying with the result. And uh, and when I had thought deeply about it uh, and I I asked him, I said, what other responses do you get from others? Uh (laughs) And he said, it's usually, it falls down into the father. Interesting. Yeah, I said, well, that's interesting. I've, you know, I know you haven't written the book yet, but I was yeah. interested to hear. And he said, yeah, it seems to be it comes from the father's mostly. And of course, that's because um, that was quite a few years ago. So mm-hmm. uh, women were not that much in the workplace. They were in the workplace, but not that much. But it sounds to me like what you're saying is. Your parents are, and your maybe your older brother too. No one ever said to you when you were young, you shouldn't be doing this because you're a woman. That is correct. Yeah. No, I've never was told I can't do anything. Uh-huh. It was it was always go for it. That's great. Go for it, and I think it's the attitude of the parents too. Mm-hmm. And Daddy didn't say to me, "You can't 
use the hammer. You're right. a girl. And he didn't say that at all. You know, here's the hammer. <laughs> now, don't hit your finger. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's important. <laughs> so it would be actually that stimulation. Yeah. And 10 years old was about the right age. I mean, you picked an age that is... Awesome. <laughs> it's definitely an age, I think, when you're you're just getting ready to start to think about some of your own needs as you transition, like, t- into high school later. Like, you have to start thinking, I guess, about what subjects matter and all that because you're beginning to mentally prepare for college. So I think, you know, at 10 years old, I definitely was a tomboy at that age, and my parents always let me do whatever I wanted. But it, it, it what's interesting to me is it was really other women who who were your first experience with the the kind of gender discrimination. It was the nuns who told you, That's right. you know, that you couldn't. <laughs> Women don't do things like yeah, that. Right, <laughs> right. It's fascinating. <laughs> and you're right, though. It's it's a, it boils down to, yeah. yeah. Well, in, in fact, that that invoked determination. That's good. I mean, they it clearly of, didn't stop you, and. Clearly, your father believed so much in you being able to do it that he was willing to sacrifice his retirement. And that is that is a good, solid foundation to set you up for taking those challenges that came your way. That's Well, they had challenges. My poor parents, I felt so sorry for them. In retrospect, when, in older, when I realized what was happening to them, when they decided they were going to send me allow me to go to Purdue and daddy Mm -hmm. took his his retirement out Um, the family revolted Mm -hmm. all of the brothers and sisters of both my mother and father said they were crazy and they should not do that you don't do that for a girl oh dear and they received flack like it was unbelievable Hmm. they some of them stopped talking to him because they were insane to want to do this for a girl wow and they went through a lot of family pressure, and it was so unfair. I thought, what kind mm-hmm. of people? These are relatives? Yeah. And they were so mean about the whole thing to my parents and mm-hmm. wouldn't invite them to things. And mm-hmm. it was just a, a streak of meanness. And maybe they, I, I just can't imagine what goes through it, went through their minds. But it was a difficulty for them, and they persisted. Yeah. And my mother was staunch on that you know you're gonna do what you're gonna do it seems like your parents were really forward thinking for their time especially because they didn't have that educational background themselves I think you know clearly they cared about you enough to want you to have that so yeah um, I just have one question really left and that is um what would you like for your future great 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 grandchildren to know about you Oh wow! <laughs> oh, I would I would like that to leave that education philosophy, mm-hmm. and if if I could talk them into engineering, I was not successful with my immediate grandchildren because uh, for various reasons they were influenced in other ways mm-hmm. to uh, not go into the technical world, uh, but. Uh, I would want them to to know the importance of education and to support people in 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 education, and I would want them to definitely uh, understand the basics of physics and math. I mean, this is what the world is made up of. Uh, I gave some classes to students uh, uh, about how to fly a, a paper airplanes and what holds it up and why does it go up, and, oh, it, and then a little uh, competition where I gave them presents afterwards. Oh, how- <laughs> And uh, that made the newspaper. Uh, I said, "Whoa, it made the <laughs> newspaper! Oh my gosh!" We said the so Daily you News. Did, you did that as part of one of the talks you were giving to local schools. Well, or? they invited me. Uh, 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 it was a woman's group that was uh, putting together. Uh, they wanted to have diversity, uh-huh. and they couldn't find any technical women. <laughs> so, and they heard about me because someone said, "Oh, Roberta's an engineer, really?" Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how they. They That's invited great. me to come and give a class, and uh, um, I thought, "What do I teach them?" What, you know, and it was interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. The uh, it was a lesson for those students that, uh, because the boys did not want to do it, the girls, and I said, "No, you're you do you're going to be partners with the person next to you." 
Yes. No, you no changing seats. Yes. If you're in this, you're going to do. T- <laughs> and and it was at the end when when uh, they I had the contest and everything, and the uh, the guys were so thankful because the young women did a better job at it and actually directed them how to Isn't do it. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> I for, loved it. For all of those misconceptions, the, the studies really show that women usually are applying themselves more in school and trying harder and getting better grades. But yeah, yeah just the fact that those stereotypes still persist is so troubling, I think. <laughs> and one, one of the young men uh, followed me around for the rest of the day. He said, I want to be an engineer. I want to be an engineer. Oh, I want to be an engineer. <laughs> no, I want to be an engineer. <laughs> he was so cute. He wasn't letting you out of his sight, was he? <laughs> <laughs> he learned his lesson about young women and engineering. That was a wonderful lesson, and it taught the the women that they could work with men as leaders. That's you know, right. Or young women, as, with young men as leaders. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. I think I saw a photograph maybe from that moment on the video for your award. Did you have a picture with the students and the planes? Uh, I know I've seen this somewhere. I don't recall. You know, I don't. It's so interesting. I, you think I'd. I gave them a thousand pictures and said, uh-huh. pick what you want. <laughs> yeah. I'm and, pretty sure that's uh, in that It could YouTube be the, was the class I had if there was a spread of students. Uh, I don't think they took the one from the newspaper where they actually. We We're had one them. young woman was uh, with the boys helping her on the side of uh, the winners of oh, the. Oh, what fun. Yeah, but well, I, I think, think. Doesn't Purdue have a contest like that? They may now. I mean, this was years ago. I think since the time I've been here, I've heard of them doing it, but it may just be an occasional yeah. thing. Yeah, but it would be like, interesting to know if yeah. any of those young people ever had to use those That's skills. 25 again. years ago, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it really. <laughs> could have been started up by them as a new tradition. <laughs> well, Roberta, I have asked you my questions, but I wanted us to leave time. You know, there you've been interviewed many times, but I know that. You know, there may have been things that you would like to talk about about your life or your influences or things that have been particularly important to you. And so this is kind of a time for you to, um, I guess, put on the record for current and future generations things that, that matter to you in terms of someone researching your life or researching what life was like for women engineers at this time. You know, any, anything you'd like to share for the record? No pressure. No pressure. (laughs) Uh, I go back to the fact of of one knowing oneself. Mm. Uh, That is a basic that I really like people to, and family or anyone else, is to to be introspective and understand oneself and Mm -hmm. what what brings joy and uh, how one can contribute to the world and make it a better place Mm -hmm. and never give up on anyone because you see people who do wrong things and sometimes you help them out and they can be a productive member of society. Mm -hmm. So it's always knowing yourself and and reaching out. I believe in, in the reaching out, and I called it reaching out for success when I was... National President of the Society of Women Engineers, uh, because you do have to reach out. That was a problem the society had. They were introspective, Mm -hmm. but they didn't do any analysis of themselves or understand why they weren't growing and uh, helping and doing what, because they really didn't quite understand. Mm -hmm. So I, my mantra was reaching out for success. And that's what you have to do to have success. So I would tell especially young people, reach out. You just don't know where your opportunities are going to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't write anything off as a failure. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, everything is a learning experience, and use it as the next stepping stone for going forward. And to try your best to enjoy everything. Not mm-hmm. every step is a nice step. <laughs> Not every step will bring you joy, mm-hmm. but to keep the thread going, don't yeah. let that hold you back because it's it's difficult, it's painful. Uh, I you may think that that's an obstacle I can't handle. One can't handle it. It's mm-hmm. just a matter of stepping back and saying, okay, now how do I go about doing this mm-hmm. and not let anybody get you down. You know, but take it that people say that you're no good. Uh, you are good. Yeah. You are really good. Mm-hmm. And you have a lot to offer, and the world becomes better mm-hmm. with that. I would, I would want my 
grandchildren, great grandchildren to know that they can they can they can move forward and stand on other shoulders and others will stand on their shoulders mm-hmm. to reach higher for the clouds mm-hmm. and be able to do well for themselves. That's kind of a, a cycle I think throughout your story is um, that interest in making the path easier for others that follow. So I think that's a, a wonderful message to leave for future generations is, you know, no matter how much we struggle, we, we're we here to try to make it easier on the next generation, right? No, it's so, so true. That's so great. So true. Well, is there anything you wish I'd asked or anything else you'd like us to have on your official oral history? Oh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I have three children. <laughs> yeah, tell us, about your, tell us about your children. So I know that you have... Is it one daughter and two sons, or is it That three is correct. Sons? Okay. Our list is Alexis. Okay. That, I think I saw the name, and I wasn't Alexis, quite sure if it Alexis was. Alexis Glider Schroeder. She uh-huh. stuck the glider back in. Oh, good for her. Good for <laughs> and that, which was very nice. I, that meant a lot to me when she did that. So she's your oldest? She's uh-huh. the oldest. And then um, our uh, son, Chris Glider, and uh, uh, he's uh, just uh, very intelligent and... Uh, accomplished young man that's not so young anymore (laughs) 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 and uh, then Nicholas Glider who's uh, very busy with his career with uh, California Occupational Safety and Health and and Uh managing part of that and he's uh, uh, good hearted and one of the things I guess I would I would want to share that uh, I discovered just recently can you believe after all these years uh, I wondered because because uh, both of my sons uh, have had a divorce in their life mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was interesting the women they selected were very challenging women that uh, had problems mm-hmm. and I thought what have I done wrong I sat back and I said now let's see that's two what, what have I done wrong mm-hmm. And I realized that what I did wrong was not expose them to a baser element. I always made sure it was enriching friends that uh, that uh, had uh, were interesting people. They were courteous. Uh, they were caring. Uh, they were uh, uh, all intelligent and mm-hmm. and very good. But I did not. Uh, introduce them to the fact that some people are mean Mm -hmm. some people are basically nasty some people are psychopaths Mm -hmm. I mean I I did not introduce them to any of those concepts Mm -hmm. so they didn't didn't weren't familiar with that and it was always you know they had to hit them in the head and that answered all my questions when I realized that I had fallen down on my job as a mother without mm-hmm. sharing that there is a baser element out there that are not all good, kind, and giving. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, you have to be prepared to deal with those people as well as the the people that are raised like you are, mm-hmm. and uh, and you can be productive and work with them fine. Uh, definitely don't want to marry him. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> because I said that oh, that causes a problem sometimes. In yeah. fact, in most cases it was. Mm-hmm. So it was a discovery that, a uh, late in life discovery of what uh, I could have done better for my, my children. But it was wonderful that I was able to be there for them, be PTA, run tennis tournaments for uh, them, and... Mm-hmm. and uh, um, uh, I just to uh, give them the example of one could move forward in other fields. They knew that I was an engineer, but I was out there in the forum in Los Angeles playing tennis, and Margaret Court is talking to me, <laughs> <laughs> saying, "Have you learned anything on the court here? Because I'm, you know, I'm a nothing player, and I was in the finals of a Virginia Slims tournament wow. uh, for uh, uh, for the region, How and fun. and uh, uh, to see that one can do many things." Yes. And uh, you just not, you know, pick one thing that you do. You can do many things. Well, you definitely gave them the, the strength to be able to move on when this when they recognized the situation wasn't. Good. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Yeah, and then to be there for their children and for anyone else that means something to them to mm-hmm. be there when they need help, be there to support them. Yes. Yeah. I would definitely 
uh, want my great grandchildren to understand that and and be productive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this interview. I appreciate it, Roberta. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it very much.